Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second of our quadcast shipping specials, dealing with the consequences and legal implications of a major maritime incident, such as that of the grounding of the Ever Given in the Suez Canal. Last week, you heard from several of our colleagues on the more immediate consequences of such an incident, including salvage and GA issues and liabilities as between owners and charterers directly involved in the incident. If you missed that live, you can still catch up on YouTube. This week, we are going to be looking at some of the wider implications of such an event. I'm sure none of you watching will need me to tell you just how significant an event the Ever Given incident was. The ship blocked the entire Suez Canal, holding up vessel traffic for six days. That had a huge knock-on effect on other vessels, with more than 400 vessels being backed up to the Mediterranean to the north and the Red Sea to the south. Needless to say, that had a very significant effect on the movement of cargoes bearing in mind that some 12% of global trade is carried on around 19,000 vessels using the canal each year. Now, these significant impacts on the global supply chain inevitably lead to the possibility of third-party claims against those more directly involved in the incident. In light of the impact on other vessels, charter parties and cargoes, there are also claims by other owners, charterers and cargo interests to consider under their respective contracts as well, of course, as insurance claims by those parties. Now, it's these wider issues that we're going to be looking at today. I should emphasize that whilst the Ever Given provides the context for our discussion, the points we're going to be discussing are not specific to it and apply more generally as regards any such major maritime incident. So let me introduce, first of all, I'm Caroline Pounds, and with me are Chris Smith, you see. Chamber's newest silk link in the Warren de QC and Paul Henton. Now, before we kick off, I should say that we welcome your questions and input, just as long as you don't ask any difficult ones of me. Um, we have received a few in advance, but if there are any more as we go along, please do put them in the Q&A function and we'll do our best to address them at the end. We also have a short networking session at the end and we'd obviously be delighted if you could stay for that. Now, we've got quite a lot to talk about, so without further ado, let me hand over to Nicola, who is going to start us off by talking about cargo interests and slot charters. Thank you, Caroline. Um, our colleagues last week focused on the position of the owners and the intermediate time charters at the top of the chain, and I have the, um, the benefit of dealing with the bottom, if I can put it like that. So just to give you an overview, working from the bottom up, and hopefully we'll meet in the middle, um, under at the very bottom, we have obviously have the cargo interests involved. Then we have the slot charter parties or vessel sharing agreements, which many of the container lines have as part of the wider alliances they formed with other container lines. And then one of those container lines, if they're not the owner of the vessel, is probably a disponent owner under a time charter. Now that needn't be the one with the uh, owner or demise charter, it can be a second one that lies beneath that. So I'm not going to talk about the liabilities under any time charter today. Our colleagues dealt with that last week. Um, what I'm going to deal with instead is the um, cargo interests and the slot charters vessel sharing agreements. So starting at the bottom again, cargo interest claims. The framework is the uh, bill of lading which is issued. The bills of lading tend to be on container line terms rather than the owner's bills, and that in itself creates complications because what you then have are containers all carried on the same ship, but subject to different terms and conditions, and you don't have the incorporation of the charter party above. There are lots of different container liner bills. You can find them on the internet. If you're really bored one day, Google them, you'll find them. Um, I think in a case I had, I think we had about 27 different varieties, um, but there are a couple of common features to watch out for. First of all, dispute resolution clauses. You will find different bills of lading have different applicable laws and different jurisdictional arbitration clauses. And with shipments to the US, it's not unusual to have the hybrid type clause where those are subject to um, New York law and US jurisdiction, even if other shipments to other destinations are not. Um, another common feature is the application of US COGSA, Hague or Hague Visby rules. I haven't yet come across one which voluntarily provides for Hamburg rules. And um, a third common feature is a form of Himalaya clause. So to protect 
supports the ultimate carrier and servicing agents by contractual clauses in the bills of lading. So that's sort of the common features one finds. So what type of claims are cargo interests interested in? Well, the focus for many, particularly in a case like the other given, is on delay and delivery and not because goods are damaged or lost. So what's the position on delay, assuming the bill of lading is governed by English law? Well, the Hague and Hague Visby rules don't touch on this matter. If you're interested, the Hamburg rules do in Article 5. And so they, in general, in English law, contracts for carriage contain an implied obligation to proceed with reasonable dispatch. Therefore, in principle, there could be a claim for delay, but watch out, because you will struggle to not find in the bills of lading either a very wide liberty clause, which permits which might, what might otherwise be unacceptable delays en route, or you'll find the express clause, which displaces the implied obligation, which says in terms that the carrier does not undertake to deliver the goods or that they will arrive at the discharge port at any particular time or to meet any particular market or similar words to that effect. Even if you were to have unusually what a bill that didn't contain such clauses for cargo interests, you can see that we may have problems in terms of the loss that they suffer, because they would have arguments on remoteness and foreseeability, which one simply doesn't have in the straightforward charter party context claimed by a charterer. Of course, if the cargo has suffered loss or damage, then we're in completely different territory. We're looking at the Hay, Pegasus, the US COGSA, all that unusual Hamburg rule provision. And then as a backup, the cargo interests have the duties owed to them in bailment and negligence because it arises at their property which has been lost or damaged. So you, uh, you're dealing with uh, things from the bottom up, you said. Um, it's right, isn't it, that uh, as you get a bit further up the chain to the sort of vessel sharing agreements that you sometimes see between owners operating container lines, there, there you sometimes do see quite detailed regimes in respect of allocation of liability for delay. That's right, Paul. So if I can grab myself up that contractual chain and go further to the top, um, they're much more bespoke contracts. They're, they're not standard term provisions. And um, so it's very difficult to be general. There are a couple of points worth noting, either on the slot charter parties or the vessel sharing uh, arrangements. Um, they may not be governed by the same applicable law or dispute resolution clause that you have either in the contract above them or the bill of lading below them. So that in itself creates another layer of complication. Um, the financial losses that a slot charter or um, a party to a vessel sharing agreement may have suffered is not necessarily just passing on the indemnity for the cargo interest claim up the chain, they may suffer additional financial losses because they own the containers and the containers themselves are stuck on the ship and they now find they don't have the containers in the right place at the right time, or they have other cargo at port ready to be uplifted. So it's not always just a straightforward recourse action, even where you have cargo um, lost or damaged. And particularly in vessel sharing agreements, it is not unusual, as you say, to have a very detailed liability regime working out who is responsible for the delays um, caused by specific events, or to provide that individual lines have to deal with the cargo interests and then bring an indemnity up the claim. Now, obviously, in a case like the Evergreen, it wasn't possible simply to wing in another ship and transship the cargo. But in other situations, it is able, it, you are able to do that. So what I would say for that layer of contracts is that they're bespoke contracts, so it's not the same as with cargo interests. So that's a sort of quick sketch of third party claims internal to the vessel. What about um, true third party claims, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Um, so obviously you use the phrase true third party claims, because what we're trying to distinguish is Claims of the sort that you've been talking about, which have all involved a contract with the stranded ship owner, uh, and the kind of claims I'm going to come on to consider, where you have cargo owners or ship owners who have a claim arising out of an incident such as this, but they're not in a position where they have a contract with the stranded ship owner, and they want to see if they can bring a claim against it, though, for the losses that they've suffered. Now, in the context of an instance such as the Ever Given, it might be fairly said, well, uh, that happened in the Suez Canal. How is a non-contractual claim going to have anything to do with English law or jurisdiction? 
Uh, and that's a fair point. And it's a point that I'm going to come on to maybe talk about a little bit later. But for the present purposes, I just want to park the jurisdiction issue for the time being. Uh, and to do so, let's imagine that we've got an incident on the Droitwich Canal that has happened uh, and that we're concerned about the massive claims that arise out of the blockage of that. So we will assume that we are in an English law scenario uh, for the sake of argument. Now, there are a couple of categories of claims that we might want to consider in this scenario. L let's firstly take delays to other vessels. I I'll give you a hypothetical scenario. Uh, I am the owner of the good ship Smith, uh, and I am traveling in ballast to meet my next fixture. Now, I'm stuck in the queue as a result of the blockage in the canal, and as a result, I missed the cancelling date for my follow-on fixture. The market goes down in the meantime, and so, surprise, surprise, the charterers cancel the fixture, uh, and I suffer losses as a result. Can I, the owner of the good ship Smith, sue the owner of the stranded vessel for those losses? Well, let's discuss, this is a true third party claim, so there's no contract which I can go on. So I've got to look at common law, tort. Well, what are my potential causes of action in that regard? Let's start off with the most simple and the obvious one, negligence. Now, the first problem the owner of the good ship Smith is gonna come up against is showing the existence of a duty of care owed to him or her by the owners of the stranded ship. Now, as a general point, uh, users of canals such as the Suez Canal or indeed the Droitwich Canal will normally be taken as a matter of English law to owe a duty of care to other users to navigate with reasonable care and skill. Uh, if I, for instance, collide in a canal channel or even in the open seas uh, with another vessel, then I will be taken to have held a duty of care in that regard. However, on the hypothetical scenario I posed, there is no physical damage to the good ship Smith. Rather, it's damage to the owner's economic interests. Is there a duty of care in respect to that? Well, as we probably all know, as a matter of English law, no. English law tends not to recognise a duty of care where it comes to pure economic loss. The position, obviously, though, might be different under other legal systems, which is obviously a highly relevant point when we talk about an international incident such as the Ever Given. The other point to make in this context is even if you get over the hurdle of establishing that there was negligent navigation, you have to show that it's negligent navigation that the ship owner of the stranded ship is responsible for. Let's say, for instance, the negligence was that of the pilot. Is the ship owner going to be liable for that? Well, again, if we're dealing with the position as a matter of English law, you find your answer in the Pilotage Act 1987 for compulsory pilots or a common law for voluntary pilots. But again, you may get a different answer under a different system of law. That's taught. Uh, just for, I say, a bit of fun, but I mean this just because it's not a subject I've had to look at since I was at university. One other possibility for an incident such as this would be public nuisance as your cause of action. Public nuisance uh, occurs where there is an act or omission which affects the reasonable comfort and convenience of a class of citizens. Uh, and as we might remember from our studies, blocking the public highway can count as a public nuisance. So you actually have to go back to your university notes to, to look that up, because I can't remember when I last looked at nuisance. I, I don't actually have my old university notes. And sadly, despite the Clark's best efforts, I don't have a public nuisance practice. So, yes, I did have to go into Clark and Lindsay briefly to remind myself of the test. Um, but uh, I'm sure you'll know, Caroline, that a claimant in public nuisance can only recover damages if they can show special damage over and above the effects that the nuisance has had on everyone else who it's impacted. And where we're talking about something like delay here, well, that's what everyone's going to suffer. Me, the ship owner of the good ship Smith, is just complaining of delay in the same as everyone else. So query if actually I could show I had suffered special loss over and above the ordinary run of events. So leaving aside such interesting questions about nuisance, I have to confess I don't have a practice in that either. Um, what about the owners of the cargo on board the good ship Smith? Do, do they have a cause of action in respect of any losses they suffer in respect of their goods? Well, that's a good point. That was the next category of claims I was going to come consider. Now, uh, as I've established already, there is a duty of care owed when navigating to prevent physical damage to persons or property. So let's say um, a vessel in a channel such as the Suez Canal 
collides with another vessel and damages the cargo in it, there would be a duty of care. And so you could bring a claim in negligence in that regard. However, what about taking instance like the uh, ever given? What about if you've got some perishable cargo stacked up in the holds of some of the vessels waiting behind? Uh, and what if as a result of the delays that cargo goes off and exceeds its shelf life? Now, uh, as I've said, English law does recognize the duty of care to prevent physical damage. Can the owner of that cargo say, well, my cargo has been physically damaged. I've now got uh, an entire hold's worth of rotten mangoes as a result. That's physical damage. And therefore you, the owner of the stranded ship, are liable to me. Well, is that right, though? Is that really physical damage? Can't the ship owner say in response to that, well, hang on, all you're complaining about is the natural and inevitable deterioration in the cargo. There's no external factor like a ship clanging into the side of you that's caused the damage. Uh, and this cargo would have gone off in exactly the same time frame, even if the canal hadn't been blocked. So actually what you, the cargo owner, is complaining about is a damage to your economic interests because you haven't got the cargo to the market in time. Now, it's a potentially an interesting point. Uh, I think that if the cargo simply perishes within the time frame that it would have perished within any event, then it's likely not to be physical damage. But if, on the other hand, let's say the cargo was only meant to be in the hold for a week because the conditions in the holds are inhospitable for a cargo of that nature, but it has to be stuck in the holds for two, three weeks as a result, I think you could, in that circumstance, argue with some force that that would be physical damage for the purposes of a claim in tort. Now, obviously, following through everything I've just said, um, where you've got non-perishable cargo uh, and what you're talking about can't on any analysis be physical damage to the cargo, uh, any losses caused by the delay will inevitably be pure economic losses. Uh, and as a result, you are not going to be able to get a recovery from this uh, if your incident occurs somewhere like uh, the Droitwich Canal, even allowing for the hurly-burly of Droitwich County Court. Um, so those are some of the potential causes of action. Uh, I'm going to coming on a bit later to talk about some of the jurisdictional issues raised. But before I do that, uh, hence, I think you've got a bit to say on limitation for our benefit. Yeah, so I mean, so the team last week spoke about uh, limitation a little bit um, and in the context of you know, where's a good place to bring a limitation fund, what are the benefits of doing that? The big development uh, which we've had is that the owners have now commenced limitation proceedings before the Admiralty Court in London. Uh, seeking a general decree of limitation under the 1976 convention uh, under English, which is applied under English law. Uh, the, the benefits of that are obvious. Uh, as we all know, the, the idea behind limitation proceedings is to establish a pot of money to satisfy any valid claims arising out of the incident. And the owners, uh, which for this, these purposes includes the charterers, would be looking to cap their liability at that uh, amount. So it's uh, Chris has been looking at all sorts of weird and wonderful claims and nuisance, rotten mangoes, whatever it is, Br bring them all in. Uh, and then uh, those claims are all submitted against uh, the fund. Now, in this case, the fund uh, it has apparently been calculated at approximately 81 million special drawing rights or 114 million US dollars. Uh, that's calculated by reference to the registered tonnage of the vessel. So the bigger the ship, the bigger the pot. Um, uh, but the, if you look at just uh, the Suez Canal Authority's claim, uh, that alone, uh, according to internet reports, is reckoned to be uh, or, or has been presented in sums uh, as high as a billion US dollars. Uh, so unsurprisingly, the Suez Canal authorities are being named amongst the defendants, along with the charter as Evergreen and uh, other potential claimants all being named generically. So the owners are obviously looking for um, uh, a, a, a cap on their liability with the, 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 the funds to then be distributed uh, amongst the various claimants. Uh, another big benefit is that if the owners uh, succeed with this tactic, then they get the benefit of Articles 12 and 13 of the Limitation uh, Convention, uh, broadly, uh, which provide that uh, firstly, claiming against the fund acts as a bar to proceeding anywhere else in the world. Uh, and also any arrest proceedings should be released if brought in states which apply the limitation uh, convention, or at least in, in jurisdictions which would recognize the English limitation uh, proceedings. So that's obviously a big draw uh, in circumstances where one of the potential claimants against the fund actually operates the Suez Canal, um, a destination to which no doubt the owners and Evergreen and their fleet would want to visit again without uh, fear of arrest. Uh, so that's potentially a big benefit. 
Um, Although in, in the real world, Paul, isn't there a risk that the biggest claimants in terms of value will, will just ignore the London limitation proceedings? I, I can see you unmuting yourself. I, you're you're <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> and, 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 and actually, uh, indications so far tend to suggest that's exactly what they might do. I mean, the vessel is still under arrest in Egypt. Uh, an application was made apparently yesterday to lift the arrest, which was uh, reviewed. So there, uh, there are no signs yet uh, that the SCA are going to recognise London as the appropriate forum for a limitation action and, and submit their claim against the fund there and then uh, carry with that the lifting of arrest proceedings elsewhere in, in, in the world and so we're happy with the security of this fund. Um, so, so, so I agree with you, that does look uh, to be a big risk. Um, now, just uh, on top of that, just a couple of other issues that might arise in the limitation action. I mean, we've obviously got the perennial issue of which claims are actually limitable. Uh, those are set out in Article 1 of the Convention, uh, claims for damage to property, uh, claims for damage to terminal facilities, so cargo claims and the like, damage to the sewage facility are all limitable. The big um, non-limitable claim uh, category uh, that uh, is likely to be relevant in this case would be claims for salvage, uh, which for obvious policy reasons are not uh, limitable per Article 3A of the Convention. And so you might have image issues of sort of categorization, whether the Suez Canal Authority's claim is properly categorized as one for local law salvage uh, or for something else. Um, we heard on last week's podcast that they're apparently claiming uh, amongst their billion dollars or so, something like 300 million in they describe as a remuneration bonus for what they coverage. So that might be an issue. Another important issue which might arise uh, is that of contracting out of limitation. So I was involved in a case called the Cape Bari, which went to the Privy Council, and it was held that it is theoretically contract out of limitation uh, by private contract, uh, but very clear words are required. So happily for my clients who are the owners, uh, the words are not sufficiently clear in that case. Uh, but it might be that this gives rise to uh, issues of construction of the Suez Canal Authority's rules and regulations, uh, those being the terms upon which the ever given was uh, permitted to access the canal and whether those amount to a complete code uh, which uh, leave no room for the statutory rights uh, to limit. Uh, but probably, as you say, Caroline, the, the really big question is who's going to participate here? Uh, will main defendants like the SCA acknowledge the proceedings? Will they attend? Will parties seek to prosecute their claims in Egypt or somewhere else seeking an unlimited recovery? Will they take the view that none of the English High Court business uh, at all? Uh, and as I mentioned, Article 13 and the bar to other claims and arrests only protects you if the arresting jurisdiction uh, recognises the Limitation Convention and the uh, English uh, proceedings as the appropriate place to, 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 to bring those proceedings. Uh, so we'll have to see how that all uh, plays out. That's interesting, Paul. Um, going back to you, Chris, um, Paul's obviously described how the English court has a jurisdiction for the limitation action, and I was talking about bills of lading where, and the contracts where we have the nice neat dispute resolution clauses. Um, what about your sorts of claims that you were talking about in terms of jurisdiction and applicable law? Uh, yeah, well, so the kind of tortious claims that I was mentioning earlier, uh, obviously, the position is not as straightforward in the claims that you were just talking about, where the parties have a contractual agreement uh, and therefore working out the form and proper law is normally a question of looking at the dispute resolution clause. I mean, obviously, there may be instances where to avoid the fund, as Paul mentioned, someone might try and bring proceedings in a different jurisdiction. Uh, but nonetheless, that raises a different question as to whether or not they can be stopped, not what is the actual forum the parties have chosen. Now, for, for the third party claims I was talking about, where they don't have a chosen jurisdiction because there's no um, uh, contractual clause, you first have to look at, well, what's the proper law? Now, again, let's assume that we're looking at this through the prism of English law. When looking at the proper law of any, uh, um, for any tortious action, the English courts will apply the Rome II regulation. Under the Rome II regulation, the default position is that the proper law of tort will be the law of the country where the damage occurs. Now, this can be displaced uh, if all, all the events and facts are more manifestly more closely connected with a different country. If so, the laws of that other country will displace the law of the place where the harmful event occurs. Either way, in an ever given scenario, English law is unlikely to apply. 
that's um, uh, which obviously, though, I should say may not be a bad thing if you're up against the pure economic loss bar that exists in a matter of English law. But that's proper law. Let's what about jurisdiction now? There's two different scenarios you might want to consider here. Firstly, your proposed defendant is domiciled in a Lugano convention country. Well, if they're domiciled in a Lugano convention country, then under that convention, the default rule is that you sue them in the place where they're domiciled. But alternatively, for claims in tort, you can sue them in the courts of the place where the harmful event occurred. So again, something like the Ever Given, not England, it would be Egypt, something like my massive tragedy on the Droitwich Canal, you could bring a claim in England. Uh, the other category of claims I mentioned is ones where the defendant is domiciled in a non-Lagano uh, convention state. In that kind of scenario, you're falling back on English common law rules. For English common law rules for tort, uh, the rules are that the damage must have been sustained in England for the English courts to have jurisdiction, or the act causing the damage must have been committed within England. So again, ever given scenario, nope, not English jurisdiction, something happening within England's inland waterways, and you're safe and sorted. Moving on then to some of the wider ramifications of an incident such as the Ever Given. Um, first, what about delay caused to other vessels whose voyage or intended voyage is impeded? Um, the delaying incident might, for example, result in a delay to the delivery of a vessel into her next charter, or a delay in her embarking upon or performing her chartered service, or a delay in her redelivery. And so starting with, re with late delivery, first of all, which where I think the position is pretty straightforward, um, most time charters won't contain a specific date for delivery, but will, as you'll all know, contain a cancelling clause. The flip side of which is that the owners are under an implied obligation to exercise reasonable diligence to deliver the vessel by the cancelling date. Rather difficult to see how owners would be in breach of that obligation of due diligence if delivery is delayed due to a maritime incident beyond their control. Under a voyage charter, however, as well as a cancelling clause, the charter will invariably contain both an expected ready to load date, together with a provision that the vessel is to proceed to the load port with all convenient speed. Now, the combined effect of those provisions is that the vessel must commence the preliminary voyage to the low port at such time that it is reasonably certain that, proceeding normally, she can arrive at the low port at the stipulated time. Now, the important point for present purposes is that in the absence of a suitably worded exceptions clause, that obligation is an absolute one. And so the owners will therefore be in breach if they are prevented from embarking on the approach voyage due to matters beyond their control, such as, for example, the blockage of the Suez Canal due to a major incident. So that's late delivery into charter or lateness in com commencing the approach voyage. At the other end of the spectrum, delay cause might result in the late redelivery of a vessel under a time charter. That, of course, will expose the time charterer to a claim for damages, unless there is a last voyage clause which protects them. But what about the effect on charters that are midway through performance at the time of the disrupting event, which in practical terms are probably the vessels which are most impacted? In broad terms, I think it's right to say that the risk will generally lie where it falls. And so under a time charter, Charterers will remain obliged to play higher for the period of delay or interruption to the chartered service. It's unlikely, I think, that there will be any relevant off hire clause that they would be able to bring themselves within. It's also difficult to see any basis upon which charterers could bring a claim against owners. While most time charters will include an obligation on the owners to proceed with utmost dispatch, what utmost dispatch requires will of course depend on the circumstances and so if the owner's intended route is blocked then the quickest route may well involve a diversion. Now of course under a time charter as long as the owners are being paid their hire it may well not matter to them very much which route they take but that's obviously going to be of much more importance much more concern to an owner in the voyage charter context where the freight payable, no doubt, at least as a matter of practical reality, be based on the planned route. And so what is an owner to do when faced with a blockage of their intended route? Do they sit there and wait it out, hoping that the blockage clears promptly? Or do they deviate 
So for example, if the Suez Canal is blocked, deviation being around the Cape of Good Hope, a route which is of course much longer. And whatever the owners decide to do, can they recover either the expenses of waiting or the costs of deviating from the charterer? Now, in the vast majority of cases, it seems to me the answer is likely to be no, and that the owners will simply have to bear the extra costs that they incurred. Whereas in the time charter context, absent frustration, the extra expenses of a delayed or longer voyage fall on the charterer, in the voyage charter context, they fall on the owner. Now, of course, the position will be different if the interruption or delay is such as to frustrate the charter, um, but we'll come back to that a little later. Um, before we do so, one also needs to consider the knock-on effect of delay in terms of schedule disruption and congestion at other ports. Um, Paul, if you unmute yourself, we've muted you again, sorry, because of interference. Yeah, I, I've been looking at uh, schedule disruption, and I think I came to similar conclusions to, to, to you, actually. I mean, ultimately, it's a question of risk allocation under the contract as between owner and charterer. Uh, you have to look at, uh, am I looking at a time charter or a voyage charter? Under a time charter, a vessel is very unlikely to be off hire as a result of uh, port or berth uh, congestion. Um, so if, if, if a port is backed up with vessels clearing a backlog, uh, time's just gonna run based on the sort of fiction that the next service rendered necessary is to sit at Anchorage or at Rhodes and, and wait for the berth to become free. Uh, the position might be a bit more uh, convoluted under a voyage uh, charter. Uh, first question would be, uh, am I dealing with a berth charter or a port charter? Uh, if it's a port charter, then uh, the owner can tend and notice of readiness, time begins to run uh, regardless of uh, the congestion. If it's a berth charter, then obviously time doesn't start to run and, uh, until we can get into berth. That can then be reallocated using a Y-bond provision, so the owner can then tender NOR and count time whether in berth or not. Uh, those charterers whose charters contain always accessible clause might be in uh, particularly difficult, uh, particularly difficult in these sort of situations. Uh, see the decision of the High Court in the Kaizikos, uh, which held that uh, always accessible is an absolute warranty. Uh, the classic definition of which is that the berth would be capable of being approached with no uh, physical obstructions. So if you can't get in because of fog or, or weather or something like that, uh, then the berth is nonetheless accessible. Uh, but if there's a physical obstruction like uh, uh, other vessels on the berth, um, then uh, the charterers can find themselves in breach of a warranty uh, that the berth would always be accessible. Um, that's as between owners and charters. Obviously, as against the limitation fund, as Chris says, first you need a cause of action against the owners. Um, and assuming you, you, you have a contractual relationship with the owners, then you're looking at a claim for pure economic loss, irrecoverable in tort. Um, so that's really where I uh, where I got to with that. Should we look now? You, you you mentioned a little bit about going around the Cape of Good Hope, which to my mind raises the other classic uh, university question of uh, frustration. Um, yes. You know, if the pandemic's taught us anything, it's uh, we all need to know our way around trital on frustration. So what are the frustration uh, implications of, of this? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the starting point, of course, is that contractual obligations are prima facie binding and absolute. Um, there are two ways in which that principle may be ameliorated. First, by way of a suitably worded force majeure clause. And second, the common law doctrine of frustration, which, as you say, Paul, sort of takes us back to trital and university days once again. Um, you'll all be familiar with the concept and will know that frustration occurs where, without default of either party, a contractual obligation becomes incapable of being performed because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. Mm, yeah, what, what does that mean, though, really, though, Caroline? Because, I mean, I've always <laughs> found it something that, that sounds kind of like deceptively simple, but then actually when you're given a set of facts, I always think it's devilishly difficult to work out, uh, actually, is this radically different? Uh, I always think the only really useful guidance that has been given by the courts is the, the point that they've stressed again and again, namely that for these purposes, it, it's not enough that performance of the obligation in question has been rendered you know, more expensive or less profitable. Uh, you need something more than that. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're, you're also right in that it's one of those sort of feel based questions where the principles easily stated, but not quite so easy to apply. 
And I mean, two, two key points to note, I think. First, the test is an objective one, of course. And second, and this sort of goes back to your point, um, the courts have stressed that what the application of the doctrine requires is what they've called a multifactorial approach, which of course tells one everything. Um, but, but, but it is multifactorial in the sense that there are a range of factors that one needs to look at. And so what are they in this context? Well, one very relevant factor is the length or likely length of the interruption or delay as compared to the unexpired balance of the charter period in the case of a time charter or the originally intended length of the voyage in the case of a voyage charter. Whilst very important, however, that's not the be all and end all as demonstrated by a case called the Sea Angel, where the Court of Appeal held that a time charter for up to 20 days, so a very short charter, was not frustrated by reason of a delay of some 110 days caused by the detention of the vessel. Other relevant factors will include the nature of the contract or service involved and the extent of the consequences of the intervening events the nature of the cargo carried and the effect of delay on that cargo, especially, for example, in the case of a voyage charter for the carriage of a perishable cargo, and also the foreseeability or unforeseeability of the risk in question. But what you've got to bear in mind with all of these factors is that none of them are going to be conclusive on their own, and they all need to be considered in the round, as cases such as the Eugenia in the voyage charter context and the Sea Angel in the time charter context make clear. Um, Going back to Paul's point about Cape Hope, it's worth looking at the Eugenia in a little detail, given that the allegedly frustrating event in that case, in the context of a voyage charter for a trip from Genoa to India, was the closure of the Suez Canal, so like the ever given case, albeit for very different reasons. The argument that the charter has sought to run was that whilst the vessel could have proceeded via the Cape of Good Hope, that longer voyage rendered performance fundamentally different from that which the parties contemplated. Um, Court of Appeal rejected that argument. Performance of the voyage via the Cape of Good Hope was not radically different, they said, from the voyage that the parties had contemplated, especially in circumstances where the cargo was not perishable or urgently required. And so it's clear from that case, and indeed numerous other cases that have specifically considered Suez Canal issues, that the fact it's no longer possible for a vessel to use the route that the parties contemplated at the time they concluded their contract will not generally frustrate the, the charter. The point being that performance by a different route will generally not amount to a performance which is radically different from the performance that the parties originally contemplated. It merely renders performance more expensive or onerous, which is not enough, Chris, as, as you've already emphasised, and the cases have repeatedly emphasised that. Where there may be more scope to argue frustration, however, is where a particular route becomes impossible and where that route is the only permitted route under the charter. So, for example, if there's actually a term of the contract that the particular route, say, for example, via the Suez Canal, be used. Um, I think I've been speaking for long enough. Have I missed anything? I just unmute myself. No, that, um, one point, and then we move on to uh, look at insurance with, with Nicola. Um, so in um, cases where the frustrating event is, is said to be a frustrating delay, um, the case is established that you have to assess the likely length and effect of the delay uh, as at the time that it was operative and without the benefit of hindsight. So what actually happened is relevant only as an aid to determining the, the reasonable probabilities and the decision was called for. So if in these cases arising out of the ever given or, or, or Chris's Droitwich example or whatever, the, the press reports and the internet articles and so on uh, at the time were giving rise to objective probabilities that uh, the vessel was gonna be trapped indefinitely or for a very long time at the time the decision was taken to declare the contract uh, frustrated, then uh, it doesn't matter if uh, they, th th those uh, predictions were subsequently proved wrong. Uh, so that's kind of likely to be the focus of the evidential inquiry in uh, those types of cases when they um, inevitably reach the, the courts and tribunals. Um, but no, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, otherwise, I, I, but, but uh, otherwise, I can think of anything else on frustration. So I'd, let's hand over to Nicola to us uh, through the uh, insurance ramification. Nicola, I will mute my Thanks, Paul. I mean, I think the insurers will 
frustrated at the ever given event simply because there's a number of them involved and there's going to be some large bills. Um, what's worthwhile highlighting perhaps as a result of this incident is um, certain aspects which may well trigger some changes going forward in the insurance landscape in the future. So if we can look firstly at the owners of the vessel who are involved in the casualty will have had a number of insurance contracts, um, one of which will be the Hull and Machinery Cover, which covers the physical damage, general average and salvage type liabilities. Um, and this casualty will have caused the hollow machinery insurance market to sit up and take note. And I say that for a number of reasons. Firstly, this casualty brings home to them that they can be exposed to significant salvage liabilities. And that's so even though the vessel has been able to sail and the physical um, repair damage bill is not going to be that great um, if the reports are accurate. So in money, money terms, in, um, their exposure for salvage has no relationship really to the monetary exposure they have for physical damage. And we have to remember that, as Paul was saying at the start of the incident, everyone was looking at a much worse, more worst case scenario and the salvage bill could have been even higher if they had to lighten the ship. We've also heard that the claims for salvage are not subject to limitation, so that's also going to be um, another reason why the H&M market are going to focus on, on um, the exposure. Um, more generally, um, the Ever Given is a sort of an example of one of the larger container ships that we now have using the same trade route. So many are going through narrow channels, the Suez Canal, Malacca Strait, Pan Panama Canal. So the, the, the fear is that this occurrence, which we managed to sort of avoid with the Ever Given being stuck there for weeks on end, um, may in fact happen in the future. So it's not surprising that we have reports now that the H&M market will be reviewing their risk exposure, which in turn may be reflected in increased premiums going forward. And we've got to remember generally that the other given is one of a series of container ship casualties that um, insurers have been dealing with in the past nine months. Moving on from the owner's contracts of insurance, the cargo on board the vessel, which has suffered the casualty, will have coverage for GA and salvage liabilities. But um, having some form of cover for loss, damage and expense caused by the delay is, is, is not the norm. Um, the standard cargo policies do not provide coverage for loss, damage or expense caused by delay, even if it's caused by a risk insured. You can, of course, take an, an endorsement to extend cover. And I suspect that having some form of cover for delay is something that cargo interests are going to be interested in going forward. Um, looking at delay more generally, I think that's been the common theme to our talks today. Um, looking at loss of hire cover and similar types of insurance, the owners of the Ever Given or other vessels may have a loss of hire cover. And I say may because unlike Hull and p &I cover, this is not a customary insurance. And even when loss of hire cover is taken out, absent extension, it is triggered by a physical damage or hull claim. And typically there's a sort of excess or retention 14 days before it starts kicking in, although that can be shorter. Um, so I think that um, where people do have loss of hire cover, they'll be seeking to get an extension of it so that there's no need for the trigger of physical damage before it starts paying out. We've also today highlighted the wider impact on vessels and other operators who um, have been um, affected adversely by the delay. Ships who were physically trapped in the Suez Canal may be able to use the blocking or trapping coverage if it was taken out. Um, again, those policies have a typical excess and retention period of at least seven days. So that may not help them in this case where um, fortunately um, it didn't take that long to move the evidence. Um, other forms of delay cover is available in the market, but the reports are it's not widely taken out. So, for example, I understand that you can get cover to respond to an incident like the ever given or the perils that are triggered. And the way in which that works is the operators identify their daily expenses and they basically insure those um, um, and get um, cover on that basis. And there is still usually an excess or deductible, but shorter periods. 
And I think that's where we might see another change in the insurance market, because as we talked and um, heard today, risk allocation within the contractual or the tortious based regimes that we know as English lawyers um, have left parties with financial loss. And it's usually when they're suffering financial loss that they're looking for some sort of cover to try and protect themselves against that risk in future. So I think going forward, the Ever Given won't just have an impact on shipping claims, but also in terms of the um, insurance claims that we see. And of course, more cover taken out means more insurance disputes in the future. Hurrah. Yeah, more disputes, music to our ears. Uh, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. That, that, that's all we've got prepared to say for the time being. So what we're going to do now is consider some of the questions that have come in. And I should say we were sent a couple of questions in advance about uh, jurisdictions for claim on third parties uh, and solutions for cargo owners who wish to claim for delay. We've tried to build in the answers to those questions preemptively into the bits we've said already. Obviously, if anything we've said has been insufficient or not covered the precise point, please tap away now uh, and we will try and deal with it. Uh, now, otherwise, I'm in charge of moderating the questions, which is normally a great gig because it means that you can actually farm out all the questions to everyone else without the actual dangerous bit of dealing with yourself. But our, our, our very first question, the person didn't get the memo for that because it came <laughs> directly at me. So uh, I, I will deal with this one. Uh, I've got a question that talks about the distinction between physical damage and uh, economic loss uh, and asks whether or not if the vessel is going to remain detained for the foreseeable future because of an arrest by the Suez Canal Authority, if that's going to break the chain of causation. So if you've got a protracted delay, which is much longer than perhaps the five days uh, that you might get if they're just purely as a result of the grounding. Uh, to deal with that question, uh, I think it's unlikely to break the chain of causation or, or to render the consequences too remote. Normally, when talking about remoteness, uh, as a rule of thumb, if you're talking about an entirely different kind of loss to that which you would have foreseen, then that can be too remote. But if it's a foreseeable type of loss, but perhaps to an extent that you can't have foreseen, that's not normally too remote. So obviously, if my vessel or, or narrow boat gets stranded in the Droitwich or Suez canals, I can envisage that's going to cause delay to the people behind me. Uh, the kind of facts we're maybe talking about where the local authority arrests me and as a result, perhaps makes the delay much greater than it would have been, may cause excessive delay compared to what's expected. But it's still just an excessive type of consequence that was already foreseen. So I, I suspect that that wouldn't be. Uh, too remote or break the chain of causation, but you're always going to get extreme cases where the delay is of such a magnitude or order that it can be said to break the chain of causation. So that deals with the first one. Paul, I've got fantastic news for you. We've got a yeah, couple yeah. of juicy uh, limitation questions uh, for you here. I'm trying to work out which is the trickiest one, which might give me the best chance of showing you up. I can't really <laughs> figure that one out. Um, I, I mean... <laughs> Ask me about random canals in, uh, in, 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 in the Norfolk Broads or something, and then you'll definitely catch me out. I don't, um, OK, well, uh, if you've seen the questions, Paul, perhaps yeah, rather than me yeah. read them out, do you want to have a go? Yeah, I'm going to one or other of them. Yeah, Great. OK, so the first one, uh, question on limitation. Would the charterer's limit be the same as the owner's, i.e. based on the tonnage of the vessel or on the portion of the vessel which they have chartered? Uh, uh, never say never, but I think that that argument would be uh, foreclosed by the uh, MSC Napoli decision, which was a case where, uh, again, slot charterers um, uh, applied for a declaration that they could stand behind the owner's limit. So uh, a limitation fund was put up by the owners by reference to the registered tonnage of the vessel, and the uh, slot charterers wanted a declaration that any claims against them uh, were... Um, were, were caught by those uh, had the benefit of that limitation fund and I think the position would be the same uh, here again and the, the big debate on charters previously was whether charters only get the benefit of the fund uh, for claims where they're acting qua owner like so at, like an MBOCC issuing a bill uh, acting to, uh, facing down the chain uh, and uh, that's now been uh, decided um, to the contrary they, they get the benefit of claims against them Quay owner or Quay charter apart from uh, for damage to the vessel itself. So I think the answer there is that they would stand behind, that they get the benefit of the owner's fund um, and that fund would meet claims against owners or charterers. Um, 
provided they're limitable claims. The, the second claim, just the second question, just quickly on limitation, was how does the limitation fund play out against the canal authorities if they refuse to release the vessel from arrest until their salvage claims have been fully settled or secured? Um, I think the answer is the vessel probably would stay under arrest in Egypt, which is what we're seeing. Uh, as mentioned uh, this week and indeed last week, there seems to be a big risk that um, the SCA will ignore the London limitation um, proceedings. Uh, as Ruth mentioned last week, uh, we applied a 76 convention, but with uplifted 96 protocol limits, whereas Egypt is a signatory just to the unamended 76 convention, uh, taking the view that they're not required to re recognize the limitation proceedings in uh, London. And as I mentioned today, um, one of the benefits of the limitation regime is that jurisdictions which recognize it uh, uh, would recognize a bar to other claims in their jurisdiction and, and, and would uh, recognize the need to lift arrest proceedings in their jurisdiction because there's a pot of, of money in London, there's a limitation fund in London, no need for arrest proceedings elsewhere in, in, in a friendly jurisdiction that applies the same convention. Uh, and as press reports are suggesting, uh, applications to uh, lift the arrest as recently as yesterday uh, have been uh, dismissed. So it would appear that the position is that unless and until uh, salvage security is struck up or, or, or a successful application is made to the Egyptian court as the place of arrest, uh, the rest is going to remain under arrest. Um, I'm going to mute myself. Chris, why don't you farm out the next question to someone that's not me? OK, that's fine. Well, we've got we've got an anon anonymous question here. Uh, the, what's the point's been raised if you've got the salvors who are insisting on a cash payment rather than security? From both the ship and the cargo is a duty of care owed by the various different cargo interests to each other to provide cash and thereby to avoid delay to other cargo um I, i'm happy to have a get anyone fancy a go at that or uh, i'm quite happy to give my two cents worth i can't see how a duty of care would arise because it goes back to your point chris that you're, you're just talking about economic loss aren't you uh yeah i agree uh, um, i mean uh, I suppose you could say, well, again, go back my scenario about perishable cargo, but but I still think it's very difficult, you know, applying the normal three prong test, you know, proximity, fairness, et cetera, for duty of care to say that I, a cargo owner, uh, um, who can say quite fairly that normally in an incident of this sort, I might be expected to provide security rather than cash and being unreasonable such that I owe a duty of care uh, to other cargo interests uh, to actually divvy up the cash uh, and not hold out and wait for the reasonable period. I mean, I guess you can deal with that in a couple of ways. You can say no duty or it's just simply not negligent for me to rely on the standard uh, situation. But yeah, I, I would be surprised if a cause of action would lie if one of the cargo owners is being difficult uh, and is uh, refusing to hand over the cash. Uh, yeah, so I agree with that. It's, it's slightly different if an owner is asked to put up security to to release the vessel. We all know that, you know, that there's more impetus to do that. But as between cargo owners, then um, no, I, I'm, I agree. OK, well, I hopefully that deals uh, with that particular question. Uh, we've got another one. If the if the if the vessel, the good ship Smith, gets stuck in a tunnel, do leisure users whose holiday trip is affected have grounds of action? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm going to take that question as a serious one. Uh, I, I suspect no, for the reasons given. Unfortunately, your wonderful holiday in the inland waters of England, which may be ruined as a result of that, or may generally be ruined just by the weather, uh, is unlikely to give you a cause of action if you're trapped waiting at the droid which lock for a while sadly because either you're talking about damages for disappointment which aren't normally recognized as a matter of English law or you're talking about uh, pure economic loss which again faces lots of difficulties so no to that one. Uh, what's we didn't ask you is, is that a holiday snap we should have asked this but you keep flicking this photograph up where did you get it from? Uh, where did I get it from? Just uh, my many times wandering around the canals, just <laughs> taking photos. When I knew we were doing this talk, I just hung around canals looking for photos so that, that I could use. Um, I think we may have time for one more question. It's 11.58. Uh, hence, you're proving to be a very popular man. Don't, don't mute yourself. Come back. We've got another question, re-limitation. 
Uh, the question is this, are you aware if a limitation fund has been established yet? And once it has, does that change the position for third parties? Uh, my understanding is that proceedings have been issued seeking a general decree of limitation. You can limit by decree or by setting up a fund or indeed by uh, pleading limitation as a defence, although then you just get one set of limits uh, as against the party that you're uh, you're proceeding against. But so my understanding is that uh, at the moment there are proceedings underway seeking a decree of limitation rather than uh, a fund having been set up. Uh, whether that will change the position of third parties, uh, in, theory, in theory it shouldn't because uh, that option is uh, is open to you to seek the decree. Um, but I suppose, it's, again, if you were looking at, say, the position in a competing jurisdiction or another arresting jurisdiction, you know, who knows whether um, locally um, the, it might have more sway to be told, for the court to be told there is, you know, a guarantee or a actual cash rather than simply a set of proceedings uh, seeking a decree of limitation. Um, Hopefully that answers that one. And that 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 now I really will be myself and stop talking about limitation. <laughs> well, I Thanks, think it's Paul. just hit 12 o'clock. So should we move to the networking session where we can obviously address any further questions? Yeah, I should say as moderator, there's a couple of questions that come in, a couple of insurance points that come in that sadly we have not had time to get to in terms of the list of questions. Uh, as Caroline just mentioned, as, and as Sarah sent the link through, there is a little networking session for about 20, 30 minutes after this. So if you have any further questions of that nature or of any other nature about why I seem to know so much about canals, then please do join us for that. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much from all of us for listening.